Children of God, we, we ought to be thankful for that. The uh, the message that I'm going to be preaching on today, and I've got, I've got a lot of different scripture, so if you want to turn to it, you can. If you want to just write down the reference, look it up later, uh, do that. Uh, a lot of times I I may go a little overboard on scriptures, if that's possible, but when I stand behind the pulpit, I want to preach the Word of God. And sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll bring out different scripture to just kind of get a point across. But I, I want you to know that it's the Word of God. It's not something I'm trying to, to get across. It's something God's trying to get across. So so don't get uh, too too judgmental with me if I have a lot of scripture going on. But uh, that's, that's my heart in it is I want you to see that it is the Word of God that I'm speaking on, not something that I've just come up with. So... <clears throat> Tapping into the power of prayer. That's the uh, the title of my sermon this morning. You know, we've I don't I don't know that there's anybody in here that's not been churched for a while, but you know, prayer is a vital part of our uh, being as Christians. And so, uh, so the title of the sermon is Tapping into the Power of Prayer. So, <clears throat> when you walk into this room and you flip that switch back there, what happens? The lights come on, right? If I don't turn, if I don't flip the switch, the lights are not going to be on. But where, what causes the lights to come on? When I flip that switch, what causes the lights to come on? Electricity. electricity. Do we see the electricity? No. We've got to tap into the electricity in order for the lights to work, right? What are other appliances in our house? You know, we can't see it; it's invisible. But it turns the lights on turns on your television or your toaster or your oven, the washer or dryer. All of those things work because of the invisible power going to them called electricity. However, none of those things work even though they have access to that electricity until you flip the switch. So if I walk in here, although although that switch you know, has the electricity coming to it, the lights are not going to work until I flip that switch. So, you've got to make that connection before any of those things work. Every true child of God who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior has access to answered prayer. You have that access, but you've got to be connected in the right way to the right Savior. So, I can, I can pray to Allah, I can pray to Buddha, I can pray to any of these other gods that people pray to, but I'm not going to get my prayers answered now. You've got to be connected to the right source Amen. of that power, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. Luke 18, 1, men call always to pray, and not to think. Philippians 4, 6, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. James 5, 16, Pray for one another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man aboveth much. The Bible has a lot to say about prayer. These are just a, a few examples of what the Bible has to say about prayer. My question then to you today is, how many times have you tapped into that power? How many times have you actually tapped into the power of prayer? Now it's, you know, as I was thinking along these lines, I was thinking, you know, we teach our children uh, when they're very small to pray at the, the breakfast table or whatever. You know, God is good, God is great, let us thank Him for our food. Is that tapping into the power of prayer? Or before they go to bed, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul keep. Is that tapping into the power of prayer? We, we use that to teach our children to pray. We teach them how important it is to pray. But is that really tapping into the power that we have access to? You know, just like these lights aren't going to work to flip that switch. I've got to tap these lights into the power of electricity. 
If I'm going to have answered prayer in my life, I've got to tap into the right source of power. Many times you'll see on Facebook, you know, somebody will be saying, you know, they've got a problem going on in their life, and people say, praying, praying. Uh, sometimes I, especially if I know some of the people that will respond with that, I'm saying, who are they praying to? You know, some, some people that respond praying, I'm thinking, I don't know that you're very godly, and I'm not trying to be judgmental by any means, uh, but, but at the same time, it's kind of like, yeah. I know you. Who are you praying to? You say you're praying, who are you praying to? Yeah, right, right. Uh, I want everyone, when I, when I talk about praying, and I talk about tapping into the right source, I want you to realize that I'm referring to the one true God of the Bible. Amen. There's all these other gods that people pray to that are not going to answer their prayers. But we, we worship the one true God that can and will answer our prayers. We've got to tap into it. Amen. The only true God that hears and answers our prayers is the creator of the universe. If you've ever prayed the prayer for salvation, then you have definitely tapped into the power of prayer. Romans 10, 9 says that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the power of prayer. Romans 10, 13 goes on to say, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The prayer of salvation is the ultimate power of prayer. There's no more powerful prayer than the prayer of salvation. Because according to the scripture, that's what saves your soul from hell. That's the most powerful prayer anybody can pray, is the prayer of salvation. Because it saves your soul from hell. Amen. Yeah. As an eight-year-old boy, I tapped into that power of prayer, and I was gloriously saved. Amen. After my salvation, I remember going to the altar and praying for my father to be saved. Every time there was an altar call, every time there was an invitation given, our church had a had one of the tables, you know, in remembrance of me. I remember climbing up and under that table and praying for my daddy to be saved. Amen. <clears throat> time after time, I would I would go and I would pray for my daddy. And then one Sunday evening, I saw that prayer answered. Before the, the pastor could even get every head bowed, my daddy was running down the aisle. Amen. The pastor later, later stated that it was as if my father couldn't get to the altar quick enough. That's the power of prayer. That's right. Amen. I prayed for my daddy and I saw that prayer answer. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> I shared with you last week some, some of the experiences that, that we've had as a family where we felt the power of prayer. We saw God answer those prayers with our daughter being born healthy, with our son overcoming the encephalitis and, and being healthy, and you know Vicky with having a stroke and having uh, breast cancer. Those are just a few of the times that we have seen God answer prayers. I wouldn't be able to remember all the times, and I'm sure that you wouldn't either, the times that God has specifically answered prayers for you and shown himself strong. Many times Vicky and I marvel at God's answers and realize that some things just aren't coincidence. Our, our saying a lot of times is, that's just too coincidental to be coincidence. Right. We recognize that it's only by God and his grace yeah. that those prayers have been answered. That's right. We see things that, you know, it's kind of like, wow. Look, look how God has brought this together when we didn't see any way that it would happen. I'm, I'm, standing, I'm standing here before you this morning because of the power of prayer. My wife has prayed for me for years to get Amen. things right with God and that God would use me in this. Amen. It's the power of prayer. That's right. So sometimes I believe we find ourselves somewhat surprised you know, when we do realize if we even acknowledge that our prayers have been answered. You know, I don't, 
I'm, I'm not an academic kind of person. I don't keep a journal or anything like that. But I think it's wise for those people to do. They keep a journal of, of their prayer requests and, or even their prayers. And then later they can look back and they can see specifically how they prayed for a certain thing and then see how God answered that prayer. I think it's wise to, to be able to acknowledge, you know, God answered this prayer. So with that being said, let's pray. We'll look at some things about prayer from God's Word and a few examples of, of people's prayers being answered. Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that we don't worship an idol. We don't worship a dead Savior. But we worship the one true God. And we worship a risen Savior. Father, I pray that you would help us to realize just how awesome it is that we can worship you. Father, help us to realize what power we have in prayer if we will just access it. So Lord, as I preach your word this morning, I pray that you would use this in whatever way it needs to be used to help each one of us to strengthen our own prayer lives and to strengthen our faith in you. Help us, Lord, to, to be able to go out of these doors this week and to share your love and your mercy and your grace with others, that they too may tap into the power of prayer. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One definition that I found on <coughs> prayer states that it's a converse with God. The intercourse of the soul with God, not in contemplation or meditation, but rather in direct address to Him. If you look, if you look up the word prayer in Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says it's an address, or such as a petition to God, big G, or a little, or a little G God, in word or thought. Now we know that prayer can be oral or it can be mental, it can be occasional, or it can be constant, it can be blurted out, or it can be formal. It can be beseeching the Lord, as Moses did in Exodus 32, 11, or it can be a pouring out of the soul, as seen in 1 Samuel 1, 15, with Hannah. We see King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah praying and crying to heaven in 2 Chronicles. Prayer can be a drawing near to God as seen in Psalm 73, 28, or it can be a bowing of the knees as the Apostle Paul states in Ephesians 3, 4. Prayer must be offered in faith that God is and that He is the hearer and the one who can answer our prayers. That He will fulfill His word when He tells us, ask and ye shall receive. Now, does that mean that he's going to give us everything we ask for? No. I can ask for a brand new Rolls Royce, but I don't believe God's going to give you that. He's not going to give us everything we ask for. We've got to ask in his will. Uh, there's several other places in, in, in the Bible, such as Matthew 7, 7, 8, Matthew 21, 22, Mark 11, 24. John 14, 13, and 14. There are several places that tell us, us to ask and we'll receive. It tells us about prayer. God's telling us to pray. If He's telling us to do it, He wants us to do it. There's also verses that tell us to pray in Jesus' name, such as John 15, 16. Uh, again, in John 16, 23 and 24, Colossians 3, 17. And there's many more throughout the New Testament. The prophets and the people of God of the Old Testament times have a history marked by repeatedly asking and receiving at the hands of God. The same is true of the early church in the New Testament. They prayed. They waited. God answered. Does God always answer the way we want Him to? Not always. Sometimes the answer may be no. Sometimes it may be wait. Sometimes it may be, yeah, I'll do that. He's not always going to answer what, you know, his ways are so much higher than our ways. Yeah. You know, well, there's so many times that 
I've prayed prayers and God didn't answer the way that I thought He should pray, that should answer. And then after He did answer, I was so thankful He didn't answer the way that I wanted Him to. I was such a, a foolish person in asking Him to answer a certain way because He knows so much better than I do. Amen. That's the power of prayer. That's right. Amen. So, he's thinking, of, is he ever going to get to the Bible? I've given you plenty of scripture. So, turn with me to, to some passages this morning. And we'll take a look at some of these together. Let's start with a few Old Testament examples of tapping into the power of prayer. So, let's look at uh, 1 Samuel 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Like I said, I've got a lot, of, a lot of scripture this morning, so don't get bogged down if you don't have time to look for it and find it. Maybe write it down and, and look it up later. But the reason that we turn to our Bibles is so that you know that I'm preaching the truth, that you know, I'm not just up here reading from some other book. Uh, if you want to follow along, that's good, because you can, you can see what God's Word says for itself. So we're going to start with verse 9 of, of 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we'll read down to verse 20. It says, So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and get it, prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. I mean, she cried while she was praying. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt in thee look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man, child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. It just says he, he was kind of reading her lips. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. He's thinking, what's wrong with this crazy woman? And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. That's prayer. She poured out her soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. That's a pretty familiar passage of Scripture if you've been in church any time at all, if you've read your Bible. We see, here that, we see here that Hannah asked the Lord, not just for a child, but specifically for a man child. She prayed specifically that day. And God didn't just give her a child, but He answered her with a man child. She had a boy. And she named him Samuel. We know him later in Scripture as the prophet Samuel. She, specif she specifically prayed and God specifically answered. That's the power of prayer. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18. I've cheated. I put little strips of paper in my Bible so I can turn to these. So don't let me get too quick ahead of you. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 18. You'll, you'll recall the story of Elijah, the prophets of, on Mount Bell, um, I mean, the prophets of Bell on Mount Carmel. Elijah had challenged them to prove the existence of Bell. Remember, Bell was a false god that was worshipped quite a bit in, in the Bible. After the prophets of Bell had basically made a fool of themselves by crying out to Bell and even cutting themselves, 
I don't want to worship the God, and I've got to cut myself to try to get his attention. But after they did all that to no avail for several hours, Elijah prayed in verse 36 and 37. And his, his prayer was answered in verse 38 and 39. So let's read these verses together. So we're in 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to read verses 36 through 39. Make sure I'm, I'm in that place. First Kings 18. You know what? I'm um, supposed to be 20. First Kings 20. I'm sorry. Second King. No. Second King, Big King. I may, I may have marked my Bible now. Maybe it's First Kings. We'll get there. Yeah, First Kings. First Kings chapter 8. I was, I was in Second Kings. That's, that was my confusion. I'm sorry. So First Kings chapter 18, verses 36 through 39. It says that it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and whipped up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. We see here that Elijah tapped into the power of prayer that day. And God answered. Elijah could have prayed to anybody else and he would have gotten the same results that the, the, the children of Baal did, the prophets of Baal. But he prayed to the one true God and God answered. Amen. Now let's look at 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20, in verse 7, we find another example of God answering a prayer. <coughs> 2 Kings 20, verse 7. And Isaiah said, Take a lump of fig, and they took it and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me? And that, I'm sorry, let's, let's go back up to verse 1. Chapter 20, uh, 2 Kings in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. So the prophet's telling him, you know, your days are numbered. You're, you're sick, you're going to die, uh, you don't have much longer. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. He's tapping into that power of prayer. And he's saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass after Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day now, or on the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. He'd just been told by the prophet, your days are short, you're going to die real soon. And now God's saying, I'm going to give you another fifteen years. And I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for mine own sake. 
and for my servant David's sake. Hezekiah tapped in his power of prayer. He was on his deathbed. I said, hey, just told him, may as well get your house in order because you ain't going to be here much longer. And Hezekiah prayed. He tapped into that power and God answered. Amen. He was sick unto death and God gave him 15 more years. That's power. What about Jabez in 1 Chronicles 14? He asked God to bless me indeed. And the last sentence of the verse says, And God granted him that which he requested. He prayed. God answered. Now let's take a look at Daniel, the great prayer warrior that was thrown in the lion's den for praying. Would we be so bold if we knew that if we continued to pray that we'd be facing death? I mean, think about it. Hungry lions, they don't care who, who comes in there. It's meat, they're hungry. They're going to eat. We're not going to look at that particular incident, but let's look at Daniel chapter 9. Turn with me over there to Daniel chapter 9. I told you I have a lot, a lot of scripture to look at this morning. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, start with verse 16, and let's read to verse 23. Daniel 9, 16. It says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thy anger and thy fury be turned away from the city of Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins, and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, Hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O oh my God, verse 18, O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes, and behold our desolations, and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. He's saying, we're not asking for what we deserve. We're asking for your mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thy own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And while I was speaking, this is Daniel, and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, we know him as the angel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came, and I come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Before Daniel even was finished praying, God had already given Gabriel the commandment: go, go talk to Daniel. Go tell him what I've got to say. The power of prayer. Daniel tapped into that power. And before he even finished praying his prayer, Gabriel was standing there talking to him, telling him, Thus saith the Lord. Daniel tapped into it, and before he finished, the Lord gave a direct answer. I know most of these are familiar events to you, but I want you to see the examples of the power of prayer that's given to us in the Bible. The very same God that answered these prayers that we're reading about, he's still on the throne, he's not gone anywhere. And he's still very much able to hear and answer our prayers. Let's consider some of the New Testament. Look at, look at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. This is where we read about Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. 
the specific prayer is not revealed to us. It doesn't tell us you know, exactly what they were praying, but we know that they had been praying for a child. Uh, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So, just to specify who we're talking about here, it's, it's Zechariah and Elizabeth. But now drop down to verse 11, and we see uh, the answer to their prayer, and we're going to read down through verse 17. So, Luke 1, 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Again, God used an angel to convey his message. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Who are we talking about? We're talking about John the Baptist. God promised Zechariah and Elizabeth that he would give them a son. And not only did he give them a son, but he used that son to prepare the way of the Lord. Another example that's familiar to us has to do with Peter. The account that I'm referring to is found in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, starting with verse 5 and going through verse 17. <coughs> Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Things looked pretty impossible for him, didn't they? And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he, made, he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. I mean, he's in prison, of all places. He's between two soldiers. He's already, you know, he's bound. Seems pretty impossible for Peter. Look at verse 11. When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, John Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Remember, verse 5 says, Prayer was being made without ceasing of the church. That was at this house. And as Peter knocked on the, at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she saw Peter's voice, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. Talk about praying without believing. Their prayers being answered, and they're telling Rhoda, You're mad. This can't be Peter. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter, but Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. 
That's what they've been praying for. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. The church was praying for Peter's release. They was praying for his safety. And apparently they weren't believing hard enough because God was answering the prayer even as they were praying it. And they brought Peter, and God brought Peter to them to show the answer to their prayer. They were tapping into the power of prayer, not even realizing how much power they were tapping into. John 5, 17 and 18 talks about how Elijah prayed, which was found in 1 Kings 17, and God held back the rain for three and a half years. God hears and answers the prayers of his children. I know I've had you turn to a lot of different passages of Scripture this morning. There's a whole lot of more examples in God's Word of Him hearing and responding to the request of His people. People just like you and me. If you look closely at the people in the Bible, you'll find that they were merely human beings. Nothing special about them. They were just going about their life just like you and I are going about our life. Different time, different place but just human people. The one thing that seems to set our biblical heroes apart in the relationship that they had with God was their prayer life. I sincerely believe that any one of us had the same access to our Creator that they had. We just don't exercise our faith enough. If you read about the evangelists and the missionaries from the past few centuries, you'll see that their success came from spending hours at a time on their knees in prayer. Praying to the one God that they served. Praying to the one true God. One of those well-known evangelists from the 19th century, and many of you may, may know who I'm talking about, is George Mueller. Just a common person like you and me. Just wanted to serve the Lord and do what God had called him to do. Many of you may have heard about his ministry. He was, an, he was not only an evangelist, but he was also the director of an orphanage in a town called Bristol, England. George was known to trust God for the provisions to be met for that orphanage. He only told God of the needs. He didn't go church to church saying, we need this, we need that. He didn't, you know, he only told God, God, you know what we need. We need this, we need that. He petitioned God for the needs of that orphanage. And he trusted God to supply them. One of the more well-known stories of, of this is when there were 300 orphans in his care. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of kids to feed. But he didn't have any food to feed them. He told the house mother to have the children go to the dining table, uh, go to the dining room, be seated. And he thanked God for the food. No one there was none in the none in the, the building. And he waited. But by his faith, God knew what was needed. And George knew that God would supply that need. Within minutes uh, there was a baker that knocked on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I couldn't sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning, so I got up and I baked three batches for you. I'll bring it in. There's food. Soon another knock came to the door. It was the milkman. His cart had just broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. So he asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled as the milkman brought in 10 large cans of milk. Just enough for 300 thirsty children. That's the kind of faith that we all should have. We should be exercising that in our daily walk. After all, our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, according to Psalm 5010. He owns those hills. And as one preacher put it, and he owns the taters in them hills. That's our God. He can surely supply our needs if we will just put our trust in Him and pray. He said in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Some of those examples that we've read about, do you think that they were expecting to see that their, their prayers answered in the great and mighty ways that God answered them? 
Pray unto me. Call unto me, and I will answer, then show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whosoever we, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. With that being said, we cannot overlook the fact that Psalm 66, 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Iniquity is anything that is sin. Here it's referring to unconfessed sin. You know, if I'm not living right, if, if my relationship with God's not right, if I've got habitual sin in my life, God's not going to hear my prayers. He's not going to answer my prayers if I'm living in sin. The only prayer that God hears of a sinner is the prayer of salvation. But as a child of God, if I've got sin in my life, I've broken the fellowship of God. You know, my children are my children. Nothing they're, they're going to do is going to change that. Yeah. But if they've disobeyed me, if they've broken that fellowship, and they've not come to me to restore that relationship, then I'm not too concerned about anything they've got to say until they come and let's get things made right. You know, God's our Heavenly Father. He loves us. He cares about us. He wants the best for us. But according to Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear me. I need to confess my sin. I need to, to bring that to Him. And I need to get my relationship with Him right again so that He'll hear me. And he'll answer my prayers. During these unprecedented days that we find ourselves in, we need to take time to be holy and pray. The very same God that answered all the prayers that I've mentioned today, He's still on the throne. He's still got the power. Are you tapping into that power today? <coughs> He's still got full control of the universe. He's not been taken by surprise, but He has opened up a great opportunity for His people to follow Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on to thy own understanding. I'm going to close with a quote from uh, he was a, a Wesleyan Methodist minister back in the 1800s. But I thought his quote was really good. He said, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. The church that lost its Christ was full of good works. Activities are multiplied that meditation may be ousted, and organizations are increased that prayer may have no chance. You get where he's going with this? The busyness of church. Souls may be lost in good works as surely as in evil, to evil ways. The one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless works, or prayerless religion. Satan's not too interested. I mean, he's not scared of, I mean, we can have all the Bible studies that we want to have. As long as we don't pray, Satan don't care. We can go to church all we want to. If we don't bring prayer into the equation, then Satan, he don't care. He laughs at our toll. He mocks at our wisdom but he trembles when we pray. So let me encourage you today to increase your prayer life. Let's pray. Father, as we've looked at the power of answered prayer, as we look at the power